So hi, everybody. Steve Cady here at Bowling Green State University, where all things change. And we have our doctorate in organization development and change here. And we have a wonderful community of, of students from our master's in organization development and change. We have alumni here today, former master's program. We have doctoral students here. And uh, we are focused on, in the doctoral program, on thought leadership. And it's about how people take their ideas, their knowledge, and scale it out in the world so people can use it and, make, and they make a difference while they sleep. And so the real, the real the idea here is that we have people uh, in, our pro, in our program, the average age is uh, 47. We've got people with 30 plus years of experience. We have people from all over the country as well as outside. We have people from different professions and walks of life, but they're all committed to transforming, helping organizations transform, helping communities re revitalize, and helping people develop their best, their potential in people. And uh, we are very fortunate to have Kim. Hi, Kim. Hi. And we go back a long way. And uh, Kim is- uh, At least really... a decade, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Kim comes, comes, comes to us. She has her doctorate and she has uh, her new book. And she's advancing her thought leadership, claiming that space, making that difference. And so when you were sleeping last night, somebody somewhere was probably reading your book and enjoying Aww. it or on a plane or doing something or sharing some piece of it with somebody else. And, and uh, so that's, that, that's what I call that passive difference making. And that's what mm -hmm. you're doing as a thought leader. So I'm really, really appreciative of you being here today. And um, my son says hi as well. Aww woman who got to meet you and yeah. kids and so forth so in South Africa really, yeah yeah when we were there for the conference the OD conference mm -hmm. yeah. so well thanks for making time and I'd love for you to share a little bit of your story of what kind of brought you here today your thought leadership story kind of how you came to be where you are doing what you do and then take us into your your top your topic okay. you'd like to share with us today so um I was born and raised in Grand Rapids Michigan um I uh, fell in love, uh, and got married quite young and I, uh, followed, uh, my Marine Corps, uh, hobby, uh, over to Hawaii for about three and a half years. Um, my father was very nervous because, uh, he wanted, his goal in life was for me to finish my bachelor's because, uh, I would be the first one in our family to do that. And uh, so he was worried that I wouldn't do it. So I had to prove him wrong, right? So I, I did finish my bachelor's and I got my MBA. <laughs> and uh, then I worked um, five years in HR, 10 in commercial banking, six, almost 16 in the healthcare uh, administration. And then I said, well, what do I really wanna do when I grow up? <laughs> So I decided that I wanted to teach. Uh, actually, I had started teaching part-time and uh, it was just something that like the minute I started doing it, I just really loved. And I felt like I had a lot of practical uh, knowledge and information to share with students. So, um, you know, that was uh, part of my uh, passion, if you will. So um, I got a job, I teach full-time uh, as a full-time lecturer at Eastern Michigan University. I also teach um, part-time at <clears throat> Benedictine University in their MSHROD program. Uh, and I was at a, and I have some scholarly articles, feel free to go to my LinkedIn page and uh, check those out, they're all, they're all there. Um, but I was at a positive business conference with uh, my co-author, uh, Mary Cechanese, and at U of M. And uh, I don't know how many of you were on, so I'm sorry if I'm repeating this, but you know, everything was just really way up here, right? Very scholarly. And uh, you know, I just it was such good information, and I just thought, you know what if we did something for the boots on the ground, right? What if we wrote something uh, for, um, you know, frontline and essential employees? So um, <clears throat> Gretchen Spritzer is uh, the chair of management organ and organizations. And uh, I emailed her and asked her to have coffee. And 
uh, we sat down and um, I told her the idea and she said, oh my goodness, uh, this young lady, Mary Checkinese, which I knew her from a project that I had done when I worked at Mott Children's Hospital. She said, she basically came to me and kind of said the same thing. And so I called Mary and I said, would you like to write a book with me? <laughs> so she said, sure. And of course, uh, just like, uh, you know, embarking on your doctorate, uh, you don't really know what you're getting yourself into when you do it, but you know, it's, uh, it certainly uh, sounds good. So um, we embarked on this four year uh, journey of uh, creating a book and it's called you can create positive change at work and it's really written probably 80 percent of it is towards the frontline and essential employees uh 20 is for maybe managers supervisors and managers and of course uh we're hoping it's a tool that a lot of uh you know of those in management would use uh to empower their employees so um yeah uh, that's that's about it and it's really <clears throat> it's just so gratifying I can't tell you I went to um an event and uh someone pulled me aside and they had uh sticky notes all throughout the book and they sat me down and you know oh my gosh and our book is extremely heavy on stories right because I we feel like you know you can share some information, but the story is kind of, which, you know, connects the dots. So, uh, you know, oh my gosh, this story meant so much and this meant so much. And, you know, and I, it just was, it was just really moving because, uh, you know, my goal, just like your goals are, you know, to change lives for the better. Right. And uh, mine is specifically, you know, geared towards helping people live their uh, best life possible at work. Do you and, have a favorite story? Do you have a favorite story? In your oh book? my, oh my gosh. Yes, I do. Could you, um, could you maybe at some point read it? Read just a little bit of it? Oh, well, I don't have the book with me. Can you believe it? Uh, oh but I can my tell goodness. It, but I can tell it. Good. So um, <clears throat> I, uh, I, and again, I'm in Las Vegas right now. So um, I'm not home. I don't, I can't reach for a book. And, uh, um, but, uh, <clears throat> and I meant, I meant to bring uh, a couple with me, but of course I forgot. So, um, <clears throat> and this is a story, it's called the parable of the pothole. And actually it's relayed. Um, it's a, a story that we uh, referenced uh, and it's a story, uh, Raj Sisodia is one of my heroes. Um, and uh, he has some incredible uh, TED talks. And uh, his latest book is called The Healing Organization. Uh, have any of you read the book, The Healing Organization? It's phenomenal. It's a phenomenal read. Um, I highly recommend it. And uh, anyway, there's a story about, uh, and this is a true story, to, uh, uh, there was a company, it's called Apple Tree Answers, and they had two classes of employees. One was kind of their professional and one was their frontline, you know, call center employees. And so as, as we know, living in the Midwest, potholes are kind of a big issue, right? Uh, especially in the winter time and in the summer, sometimes when they don't get filled. So anyway, um, the CFO was on her way to work one day and uh, she hit a pothole and it, you know, put her car out of commission. She called, uh, you know, she had a tow truck, uh, you know, tow her car away. Uh, they fixed her car and, you know, uh, delivered her car back to her later that day. And she had a major inconvenience in her life, right? However, everybody was like, oh my gosh, we're so sorry this happened to you kind of a thing, right? Uh, and one of the frontline employees, a couple days later, hit the same pothole, right? Because they don't get fixed usually in a very timely manner. And uh, it was a much different experience for her, right? She immediately uh, thought about how much money she had in her checking account. She uh, had the car towed and uh, from the place that they towed it, she asked if she could get a ride into work. They told her to take an Uber or a taxi, right? 
Uh, she's worried about money. So she calls a friend who picks her up and takes her into work. Uh, she gets into work and uh, a couple hours later, maybe two to three hours later. And, uh, you know, uh, she's to immediately told to go to the supervisor's office. So the supervisor, uh, you know, sits her down, uh, gives her a demerit or discipline uh, for missing work, you know, unexcused um, and uh, tells her two more times, you know, she's out the door. Uh, and oh, by the way, you're colleagues have been covering for you. So uh, please get out there, you know, and cover for them so you can cover for lunches. All the while, this poor young woman, her stomach's rumbling, right? Because she's hungry. She hasn't eaten. <laughs> and she has to come back and, and do her little attitude from her coworkers, right? Because uh, they had to cover for her in the morning. And uh, all the while, this young woman's thinking, how am I going to be able to pick my kids up from daycare on time and not have to pay a late fee, right? You know, how do I have, am I going to have money to cover this, right? I mean, she didn't even have time to respond to her boss because she had so many other things going through her head, right? And so uh, the CEO uh, heard the story and he was just, he was just aghast that, um, that there's just, such a difference in how their two different classes of employees are treated. And so he uh, made it his life mission. He kind of started a, a fund, you know, to help more of the hourly employees when they're stuck in dilemmas and things like that. And, uh, and it made, he made it his goal to kind of close the gap on how uh, the two um, different classes of employees are treated. And surprisingly, the turnover rate, once he did this, the turnover rate of the hourly uh, and essential employees reduced dramatically. And that's a huge cost savings, right? You know, turnover is the number one expense um, of HR, uh, of the people costs of companies. And uh, so anyway, it was just a win, win, win. Uh, from all, on all levels. And uh, I just love that story because, you know, it's as leaders uh, of companies, I mean, how many senior leaders, how many in the C-suite uh, take care of customers? They don't, right? Um, their employees do. So it's important that they treat their employees well so that their employees will treat the customers well, right? So anyway, Jim, that's, Jim, that's 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 very moving, and it and it also hits on one that I've seen a story that's on the, the internet. I wish I could sh share it. It's a video. It's a bo young boy who comes in the class every morning after the bell rings, and he walks up to the teacher, and the teacher smacks his hand. It's you know with the ruler. It's uh you know it's in a um, I think it's in India. You know, in more like a Catholic school model. Like you've heard, like I used I got hit on the hand when I was a kid by a Catholic. Mm -hmm. Teacher wants. I so, got a spanking. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, he would walk in. She'd smack his. He, the teacher would smack his hand. Go sit him down every day, and so the teacher was walking in one day, and he looked one day and looked up, and he saw the boy going down an alleyway, going to, uh, going around the corner, and coming back around the corner with the uh, his his little brother that was in a wheelchair and pushing him and taking him to where he needed to go for the day. And he took him to where he needed to go for the day first, took care of his little brother. Then he would go to the classroom and the teacher smack his hand. The teacher did not know the story. And, you know, it's, it's uh, I think that story as well relates the importance of asking questions, right? As a leader, asking questions and really understanding the full picture because, uh, a lot of times we make assumptions and we think we know what's going on, but we don't always know what's going on, right, with people's lives. And I think that, you know, there's been a lot of emphasis on that since COVID. And uh, I think that it's really, uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's a really powerful thing. If I could share one more story, and then I'll kind of get into the book a little bit more, but 
I had an employee at Eastern just a couple of weeks ago uh, tell me he works for a major um, <clears throat> organization, uh, shipping and transportation organization. And uh, he works on the flight end of things. And, uh, you know, employees kind of know when a boss isn't happy, right? <laughs> he uh, he kind of caught wind that, you know, his boss was thinking of uh, coming down on an employee, you know, maybe doing some discipline. And uh, he had known, this employee knew that uh, this person had lost their significant other uh, during COVID. And so this is regular employee, you know, went to his boss and said, I just think we should sit down with this employee. I think we should, you know, just have a conversation, you know, would you humor me and do this, you know? And, uh, and so they did, they sat down with the employee and they found out that not only had they lost their partner, but they had also lost two other people close to them in the recent past. And the person was really struggling. And, uh, and they talked, you know, they talked about it. I, I don't know. I know that you asked how they could help, you know, a lot of times people just want to be heard. Right. Um, you know, and, uh, and almost immediately that person's, uh, work behavior and their work performance turned around, you know, sometimes it's just knowing that somebody cares. And the thing I love about that story is, um, he didn't, this will, this was initiated by an employee right? This wasn't initiated by a manager. And uh, he said that his boss came to him, uh, you know, later, um, a week or two later, and really thanked him for taking that initiative. And I just thought it was so powerful, because this is the kind of stuff that employees, the difference that employees can make, right? And uh, in, in this world, and it doesn't always have to be a boss that initiates um, these positive changes, right, in the workplace. Uh, in fact, sometimes a lot of bosses depend on employees to come up with ideas and, you know, th that the bosses can harness and move forward, right? Because, you know, bosses are people too, and sometimes they can't have all of the ideas. And so uh, anyway, I just thought that was a really uh, powerful story, how someone just did good and really kind of saved a person's job in the meantime. Which, of course, then saved the company a lot of money, right? right? <laughs> so, Thank yeah. you for sharing that. That's a, that's a good story. So, I, you know, I'm thinking about how I can share the book with you really quickly, like the whole um, synopsis of the book. And um, my co-author and I were on the news a couple of weeks ago, and it's a little four-minute clip. And I think if I showed it, did any of you see it? Did any of you, was it sent out beforehand? I think if I share that with you, it kind of gives the whole summation of the book and then we could maybe ask more questions. Does that sound okay? What do you think, Steve? That sounds, that sounds great, go ahead, yeah. Okay, let's see. Okay, it says, let's see. Okay, who can share? All participants. Um, oh, my, my thing is a little different. Shoot. It says, oh, what am I doing? I don't know what I'm doing. Okay, here. And you got it. You should have permission. To yeah. <laughs> I was getting into advanced, uh, something advanced. Um, I also want to, if you, any of you are interested, um, I, I, of course, I think my YouTube page is pretty cool, but I have on my YouTube page, I have two playlists and one is uh, living a life of purpose at work. And the other one is living a life of purpose. And uh, a lot of these are um, videos that I show in my classes. So if any of you are interested, um, I would like to encourage you to check them out. And this was- uh, You can put that in the chat, that'd be great too. And we'll make sure it's available for oh, okay. listening uh, later and through the okay. podcast. Sure. Okay, here we go. Can you make it full screen? Yeah. I'm... Here 
at the office. The title is You Can Create Positive Change at Work. And authors Kimberly Barker and Mary Cechanese you hear it okay? are here with us now. Kimberly is a lecturer with Eastern Michigan University's College of Business, and Mary is a retired educator with U of M's Business School and currently runs Dynamic Connections. So good morning. Thanks uh, to you both for joining us this morning. Thank you, Kevin. So Thank you for having us. Of course. Kimberly, let, let's start with you. What motivated you both to write this book? We wanted to empower employees, employees at all levels in the organization. You know, I read in the Wall Street Journal the other day that 4 million people left their jobs just this last February. Whether you call it the Great Resignation, the Great Reset, the Great, Eva the great Reevaluation, um, people are wanting something different and they want to be heard. They want to know that their opinion matters in the workplace and we want to give them the tools so that uh, they can empower themselves and be the leader they were meant to become. So Mary, would you say, I mean, is this book geared more toward the employee's perspective or is it the employer's perspective or is it both? Actually, it's both, but it's heavy on the employee. There's so many books out there that are for managers, directors, supervisors, et cetera, but there's nothing for staff. So about 80% of the book is, is focused on employees and 20% on managers because we want to help them as well understand their staff and give them tools to also help them. Well, and, and Kimberly, we'll go back to you. Um, you know, how do you think this helps the, the average everyday employee? I know every workplace can be different, um, but you know, and I think you, you break this up into categories throughout the book, but can you walk us through a little bit there about how it can actually help people in the workplace? Yes, um, so we have four fuses in the book. The first one is forging a positive workplace. And that all begins with um, creating an environment of respect, compassion, gratitude, and forgiveness. Um, the next one is the upside of change. And we want to teach employees that change can be a good thing, right? It's kind of scary, but change is the new normal today, right? <laughs> and so um, how, how can they measure their reactions to change and harness it in a positive way? The third one is a strengths-based approach. So how can you play to your strengths instead of your weaknesses? It's not that you're not going to work on your weaknesses, but you're really going to harness what are your strengths and use them for good. Right. And it's so easy, you know, when, when maybe you're not happy in, in uh, the place you work and you can just be negative all the time where a lot of yeah. things are just happening and you can just kind of get down. But really, it's about how you react to it. Um, th and then that... there's one more. Go ahead. I'm sorry. There's one more. And that is engaging in high quality connections. And when you know about each other and you really care about each other, it brings a whole new meaning to work. And so we have several uh, tools. We have a toolkit for employees, a toolkit for managers, and we give them concrete tools on how you can create uh, more high quality connections in the workplace. Well, I know we just have a little bit of time left, but you have some dates for, for uh, professional development regarding the book as yeah. well. Um, yeah. Mary, do you know when, can you give us when that first date is and where people can go to get more information on that? Sure, it's June 15th is the first date. And uh, we have a flyer that's available. We're happy to provide people. They can reach out to us um, through uh, social media or our email addresses, and we're happy to provide them with that flyer. Great. We have dynamicconnectionsllc.com. The book is You Can Create a Positive Change at Work. Uh, Kimberly and uh, Mary, thank you so much for being with us this morning, and uh, I hope the book sales go great, and, and congrats on the new book coming out. Thank, thank you, so you so much. So oh, that kind of gives a high level view of everything. Oh no, what did I do? I forgot to. There we go. So um, I, I also want to tell you that was like an out of body experience. <laughs> I was so nervous to watch the playback because I had no idea what was going to, how it was going to be. So, um, but uh, yeah, um, I guess even if you're nervous as heck when you're passionate about something, right, you can uh, <laughs> rise to the occasion. So 
Um, I mean, one thing that we, we really, we spent almost a year in discussion to come up with these four fuses. And, uh, you know, we just really thought that of positive organizational scholarship, uh, you know, these are like kind of the four building blocks, if you will, of that. And, uh, and so, yeah, like I said, this was quite a, quite a process. But um, one thing that we're really proud of like uh, uh, in the book is, first of all, we have a lot of video links. Uh, you know, we have stories, we have a lot of video links so that, you know, someone can really um, take their knowledge, you know, a step further uh, if they're interested. But uh, we have chapters 13 and 14 are um, toolkits. And uh, the first one is for staff, toolkit for staff. And there's about 15 to 20 different exercises uh, in each of those uh, chapters. And so 13 is for staff and 14 is for managers and how they're, they're things they can use, right? Tangible things that they can use uh, with their employees uh, to create uh, more of this positive business environment. Um, and that was just really important to us because uh, again, we're trying to take something that's of more of a scholarly, um, something that was created, you know, a more of a scholarly endeavor and apply it uh, to, you know, actual workers, actual employees. And I think I kind of view that as part of my mission is, um, is to do that because I think that, you know, it's great. It's great. And I, there's nothing wrong with having uh, tons of academic scholarly publications, right? And a lot of good ideas come from that. But um, I also think that there's a place for people to take that knowledge uh, and uh, research and uh, apply it uh, at more of a boot yeah. on the ground. That's good. And you know, Kim, so let's have fun with that concept you just said there, because I think it's a really important concept for people to get mm -hmm. uh, this notion of thought leadership mm -hmm. and the ability to make knowledge available in an academic setting, in a professional setting, in a popular setting, right? Yeah. So you think about those three audiences and you are working in all three. You're working in the academic world. You're working in the professional settings and you're also working in the popular settings. What is the most important research finding of all the research findings that influence the book? Is there one that jumps out like that piece of research really influenced what I wrote about in a very, in a practical way. Is there something that you? Well, I think it was a lot of the, uh, we, we really reference heavily uh, Jane Dutton's work uh, on compassion in the workplace, uh, Kim Cameron, you know, Bob Quinn, a lot of the uh, research that, you know, the University of Michigan um, Ross Business School, you know, uh, kind of, branded in sort of a way, right, of, of this work and this endeavor. And we just really wanted, again, to make it uh, so that, you know, the, the, the regular employee could have this knowledge uh, and use it to their benefit. So, yeah. And could Did you I answer back? your question? <laughs> I think so, sort of, because I was actually, okay. I'm actually, I actually want to know if there's one research finding, like, for example, oh. um, you know, the, the, in, in the recent research around brain development, the one that's been influencing me a lot in the last few weeks has been the idea that, you know, there's, there's this, what's called a pre-neural network, which is what clamps down the neural network in a brain and the executive function, which is the front end of the brain where people make decisions. So that science of making uh, an anticipatory decision, may, thinking ahead, that's what I try to get my son to do, anticipate, 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 you know? And, you know, I'll, you know, I remember when I was a kid, I told my dad, hey, dad, I thought, he goes, yeah, you, you know what thought did? Thought, thought it farted, but it pooped its pants. You know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, and so my, you know, and so the note, so that's a very practical statement, old saying, related to the notion of using executive function to think ahead, right? Now, this pre-neural network 
gets unlocked and gets greatly developed between zero and seven, we know for emotional intelligence, but they are now finding that puberty unlocks it, all the chemicals that course through a brain. And so the another opportunity as an parent to, to really focus on teaching your child to think, to teach them to develop, that the another opportunity happens during puberty. And so you don't wanna lose that opportunity to really be there to support your children and thinking and so forth. So that's what I was saying is, is there a research finding that really influenced your thinking in the book? Uh, one of your principles, like one there's, there's you have your, your fuses. Right. They were informed by research, you're translating it. Well, what yeah. could you show us, kind of walk us through the logic of, here's the research finding, here's how it influenced me. And this is how I instantiated it in this book to make it accessible. Yeah. And you know, I think each of these fuses are kind of a result of, of you know, thinking um, of the scholarly research and, uh, you know, kind of um, applying it. And each of the fuses, I think, can be used separately, right? They don't need to be, and, the, and they're not really a, an escalation in any way, but we did put the fourth one, which is uh, engaging in high quality connections. Um, and we did put that last and we do kind of feel like it's the hallmark. And what that means is when you have high quality connections with people, right? It changes, it changes your relationship, right? With people, it changes um, when you care about somebody you know, it changes your work relationship with them, right? So uh, let me give you an example. Um, <clears throat> there's an exercise I, uh, we put in the book and I do it uh, in almost every one, the beginning of every one of my classes. And I'm happy to share the exercise with you if you'd like. It's called the high quality connections exercise. And um, we come together and I got this exercise from the book Lift. Uh, you can create... Uh, a positive, um, positive work in any situation or something like that. It's by uh, Bob Quinn and his son, Ryan Quinn. And uh, you get together in groups of three and you ask people to come up with three core stories about their lives. And, uh, and then they each have two minutes to share each of these stories, right? So you go one round of story one, run one round of story two, one round of story three, right? And I love doing this. I've been doing the exercise virtually and it's still very effective, but when you do it in the classroom, you know, there's a good amount of engagement in story one. The engagement goes up dramatically in story two. In story three, the whole class is just kind of, you know, engaged if you will. And, um, and it's, it's, a, it's a secret sauce for my, the whole semester, right? Because one of the questions is, you know, what did you learn? And in so many situations, people are like, we learned that we're a lot more alike than we are different, right? And people come into the classroom, kind of have their game face on, right? You know, and, uh, and they, uh, this kind of breaks down those barriers, right? That whole exercise breaks down those barriers. And, uh, and you know, I just think that, well, let me just share one more and then I'll, I'll stop. Um, I was teaching an MBA class. It was the very last class of a cohort. And I was going in to teach the class and I thought, I can't do this exercise, right? These people have been together for a year and a half and something inside of me said, do the exercise. So I did the exercise and people learn stuff about each other that they had not known. They were like, oh my gosh, I had no idea of, about this, you know, about you. And it's like, because people, and it just made their connection really a lot stronger. And, uh, and I just think, wow, that would have been a missed opportunity if I hadn't done that exercise. And uh, we play roles, right? We're really good at putting on maybe a, the right hat, right? The right role in a situation. 
and uh, and what this exercise kind of does is break down those roles, break down those barriers, and so people can be more of their authentic self. And I think that that is one thing that's just really important to me is for people to be able to be their authentic self at work, um, as well as being able to show empathy, right? I think those are kind of the two hallmarks of, if you will, that I really wanted to convey in this book. Oh, Steve, you're on mute. I love using my space bar. It wasn't working. <laughs> so so uh, that's really great. I'm going to ask people here in just a second. I'm going to ask you one more question and give people a chance to think. And I might put V uh, up uh, or Tom on the spot. I'll start maybe with V because she's putting, putting some cool stuff in the chat. But I wanted yeah. people to share with you their reaction. What, what Of what you've shared, what's the reaction? And what are they still curious about with you? And then And we'll check in with everybody here as we go. But and for you, the one question I want you to answer before we uh, open it up is there was a moment you went from thinking about being a thought leader, thinking about, and, and, and for me, thought leadership is not about being a bestseller. For me, thought leadership, you know, thought leadership is not about you have to have something that everybody's reading. It's simply being willing to put what you know down on paper or digitally on paper in a way that you can share it with someone else to hopefully as a gift influence them. It's to own your wisdom, own your own expertise, own what you know, and offer it to others and be willing to be seen for what you know. It's that it's it's that generative valuing of a person's wisdom. And it's us doing it first, right? We have to value ourselves first. So as you move in this direction of sharing what you know in the world, was there a moment where you made the decision, it's time for me to share and, and step out and be seen? Can you, do you have a, a, a moment where you go, yeah, you know, I'm, it's, I'm ready for this. Was there a moment that that came up for you? Well, I, I think that, um, I just really, I, I think that conference was kind of a pivotal moment when I just was like, because my my heart and my passion is really to empower and I encourage everybody to come up with their own mission, vision, and values. So that's just really important to me. And, and, you know, my um, mission is to empower women and everyone else too <laughs> in positive business and leadership, right. With a focus on um, fun and inclusion. And so when I, I just saw that opportunity and it was just like the light bulb went off, right? Um, you know, I feel like the work I'd done beforehand kind of prepped me for that. But, uh, you know, I think ideas and opportunities come uh, in a variety of ways and methods, right? And I think when you're living your authentic life and self, uh, they come to you much more frequently, right? Uh, Thomas Jefferson said, had the quote, the harder I work, the luckier I get, right? <laughs> so uh, when you're in that space and you're, uh, you know, being your authentic self and you're working, these ideas just come along. And, you know, that idea came along at the conference and it was just something that I, I, I couldn't just let slide, right? Um, when I first started my PhD program, someone came and talked to us and, you uh, they were like, you need to have a journal. You need to have a journal and you need to write your ideas in the journal. And I was like, is this what I'm paying good money for? Someone to tell me to write in a book, right? <laughs> um, and, and then I, I, right away, my ESTJ brain, I stopped myself and I said, no judgment, right? You're just going to do it. You're just going to follow what they say. And, you know, I'm probably on my eighth journal right now. Right. So I have ideas, a lot of ideas. Um, and some of them are crazy. I tell my students, sometimes I think this is what my husband's going to use to commit me someday, right? My journals. <laughs> but, um, but I, uh, they come and sometimes they go, you know, but I write them out, I write them out, but you just know when that situation, when it's there and you're like, you just have to do it. Right. You just have to do it. And 
I'd never written a book. I had no idea. I think the person that I, uh, I chose to partner with, we complemented each other. We complemented our, our strengths complemented each other very well. And, uh, I don't want to say if I hadn't partnered with Mary that this book wouldn't have happened, but uh, we had a lot of peaks and valleys and, uh, and definitely having that right partner really helped us persevere through the valleys. That's great. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. So I'll open it up. I, you know, V, if you'd like to jump in, Dave, you uh, brought your camera back on. You might have something, Tom, I'm sure you have an idea. So V, I'll open it up and start with you, and then we just we'll just kind of check in with you and our reactions, what we're reflecting on, and maybe what we're curious about. Thanks. Um, yeah, I I I look forward to reading the book. So thank you for the symposium to <laughs> raise my awareness about it. So that's a good thing. Um, where my mind is is that yes, we need to have our employees feel empowered um, to the degree that they can. Um, in influencing, you know, their experience at work. And, and then I, I think it's an and, because I think um, culture, you know, I just keep thinking about, I think it's Drucker who said culture eats, their strategy eats culture for breakfast. I think, I think the culture eats a lot for breakfast. <laughs> and it's just, um, I think people just get disheartened. So I think that's a leadership thing. And, and so I think that there's this balance here um, that, that needs to happen. But I like the fact that it's geared towards, you know, the, the workers, um, the employees and what they can do to be able to influence what their outcome is. Yeah. That, that, that's where my mind is with this. Yeah. And I so agree with you. I, you know, I mean, obviously change has to come from the top, right? A lot of, at some point it, there's a tipping point, right? Um, I think that, you know, let me use an example at uh, University of Michigan Health System. We, uh, we were very passionate about patient and family-centered care and that movement. And it kind of started at the grassroots level, but at some point it needs to transfer, you know, to senior leadership where they can be strategic and bring it down right to all levels. But I think that, um, I think we rely too heavily on, you know, senior leadership to have all the ideas. And uh, I think that any leader worth their salt or worth their weight is constantly looking uh, for and listening, right? They need to be open. That's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. And one of, one of my favorite, and I talk about this in the book, but Sydney Yoshida has an iceberg of ignorance. Uh, he has a model called the iceberg of ignorance. And I think this was in the late eighties. And he says, you know, frontline employees, they see like 98% of the problems in an organization, senior leaders see like less than 10, right? So it's important as a leader that you have, obviously you can't include everyone in your organization and everything, but that you have representation at the table uh, from all different levels in the organization and, uh, and that people are able to speak truth to power, right? Because if you have representation, but people can't speak their mind, then it doesn't do any good. Right. So, um, and, and they say middle managers, you know, they know a bit more, uh, frontline supervisors know, you know, quite a bit more than, uh, everyone else, but less than the frontline employees, but, uh, how can, uh, you know, how can leaders uh, really listen to, um, to garner that knowledge that they need to. And, uh, and I just have to say that I love this story because I love Arby's, you know, unfortunately, I love fast food way too much. But um, the, uh, the new CEO who started um, probably just after 2008, he was from Hilton, and he didn't have really fast food experience. Uh, obviously he had a lot of hospitality experience and he went on a listening tour for the first three months. And this is how I found out I was driving home from teaching one day and it was about 3 PM and I drive by Arby's and there's like a line out to the, out to Washtenaw Avenue, you know? And I'm like, what the heck? It's 3 PM. So that Sunday, I don't know what I was reading, but I saw that uh, he did a listening tour his first three months on the job. 
he, he literally, now it's a private company, so it's a lot easier to do things like that, right? But he went around to all the different franchises and he listened to ideas. And he did it half of the time for his second three months. But, and then he harnessed all those ideas. And one of those ideas was a happy hour. So I'm not trying to advertise Arby, but from two, from two to 5 p.m., they have a, a cheaper menu. And it gets all the seniors, senior citizens and the, and the high schoolers, right? The seniors in high school. And they come and they, those were like completely dead times. That was a completely dead time for Arby's. And now, because he listened, uh, they instituted this thing that, you know, made money. Now, could he implement every idea he heard? No, right? But I think it's important for employees just to know that they're heard, right? I mean, they're putting their trust in senior leadership that they're gonna do what's right for the organization. But just the fact that they are heard and that their idea is considered, I think it makes a major difference. And that's why a lot of people are leaving their jobs during the great resignation, you know, the great reevaluation, whatever you call it, is that people want to be heard and they want to be acknowledged and they want to feel like they matter to the organization. Um, and of course they put their trust in senior leadership to make the right decisions, but. Thanks, well, I'll just open it up. Whoever wants to jump in and share, you know, kind of what your reactions are and, and thoughts <laughs> and curiosity. Oh, I agree with you. Tom, or Tom says he needs to go get a Jamocha shake, yes. <laughs> Hey Kim, this is David Perry. I had the pleasure of working with Raj um, at that. Bentley University, where he uh, was big into his conscious capitalism yeah. books, and he moved to our competitor, Babson. I'm sorry we lost him, but um, your example of those three stories from the book Lift was interesting. I, I noted in the chat that I use personal histories as an approach from Patrick Lianzini's book, Five okay. Dysfunctions of a Team. And I've had people crying in a room because they're sharing their personal stories and folks that weren't getting along before gaining quite a bit of empathy for each other. And we just did an exercise at their cohort three of the DODC program on cognitive biases. And I think just as important as cognitive diversity, um, of your team, your staff. And so um, those exercises, I think, brings that out. And then you gain that appreciation, which, you know, turns into empathy in many things. So I appreciate you sharing those stories and good luck with the book and <laughs> uh, everything that's ahead of you. Thank you very much. Cool. Yeah. And Tom, Tom's been having fun. I've been, uh, you've, you've been really kind of engaged, uh, shaking your head. And I, so something's resonating with you here on her talk today. But yeah, I, I think a lot of it is just, um, I, I just did a kind of a, a session this morning with the team um, actually here at BJSU, a really strong and effective team who still said, hey, Tom, would you mind uh, meeting with us and kind of going through uh, just some, some team dynamics. Um, I mean, it's a great team, frankly, uh, but of course they're still like, hey, I'm sure we can learn something and we can kind of build forward. And um, it was interesting to hear um, there, it's a four person team uh, with one leader who, who's quite the, the maverick, he's innovative, he's agile, right? He's definitely different than um, the others on the team and um, maybe even a little different than traditional higher ed. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. And, um, uh, but the other teammates were talking about how uh, they have some challenges in terms of engaging in conversation with the senior leader. That, that's kind of a skip level um, beyond them. And um, so just having some thoughts about their conversation about how they felt in many cases that they were looked through um, and, and hearing even this other senior leaders, more of the sarcastic comments um, that the that their leader just lets roll off because he just gives it back, right? right. <laughs> yet right. these other these others don't feel that they have that same um, ability, whether it's positional or whatever it might be. And so, 
so yeah, it just kind of has me thinking a little bit more about that team and uh, um, some of the challenges they're going through and maybe some ideas of, of continuing to support that, that team as they continue to get better. And at the same time, I also work with our full-time MBA students who come in a cohort every fall semester, don't know each other. Um, in fact, most of them don't know anybody else in the cohort. Um, and I do have them every single week. Um, I, their first semester, I, I get them for an afternoon, a Friday afternoon class, which is always fun for as an MBA student to have Friday afternoon class. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, but the first 30 minutes of every class period is some type of learning experience about each other. There's always a connection because they go through this program in a cohort all together. And so getting to at least have some, so we start off pretty easy and casual, but then we start getting deeper as we kind of go into the semester to, uh, because they really do need to get to the point where they can trust each other as they're working on class projects together. And then when they graduate, of course, this is your professional network. You have 45 others now that you can reach out to who can help you from a career standpoint. So and, and can give you feedback, right? That you trust. Absolutely. Right? You, you know, and it's so important to have that group. I, you know, one thing, well, several things you said resonated but with me, but um, it's good for senior leadership, you know, to listen, but they have to act on some of it, right? Like, I mean, to just listen. And I had a friend who told me, you know, they, they were going through a merger and the new boss got them all together and said, I want to hear your ideas. And then he listened to all the ideas. And then he said, okay, this is what we're going to do. <laughs> you know, and he didn't enact on anything. Well, you know, employees know right then the, they lost them, right? He lost them right there. So, um, you know, not that you have to do everything that you hear, but you have to act on maybe one or two of the suggestions. So I think that's really important. Um, another thing, um, Dave, you know, when you were talking, I was thinking of the quote by uh, Verna Myers, which is um, diversity is being invited to the party, but inclusion is being asked to dance. And I really love that quote because mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, I think diversity is, is so important, but I think a lot of organizations don't they don't harness that diversity for good, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, what good is diversity if you don't use it to your benefit? And so I think that, that that's uh, really, really important. That's really funny. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll talk about Dave's cohort because he's in, he's in cohort three. <laughs> they, uh, with the Hogan assessment uh, that assesses them, they are high on affiliation and hedonism. Except and, for, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so herbs in the cohorts, we do have different personality types and different preferences and things like that. And so it's, we have a wonderful group of students and we had both, several cohorts come together for a social event and uh, it was great. And you, and you could see different groups that were comfortable with each other, getting together in their own little similar groups, you know, and, and we are a highly diverse um uh, program. We have 30% uh, women of color. We have, you know, uh, age diversity uh, all the way through to um, professional uh, fields diversity. And so it's a wonderful mix, right? And so one of the students in the hedonistic cohort, I'll call them the hedonists, and hedonism from Hogan, Kim, what's interesting, it's not a negative term, like a very selfish term. Hedonism from the way Hogan assessment does with its, with its coaching model, really is around people who love to enjoy experiences okay. and, and, and like, you know, the, to have experiences of life and to, in, and to experience things. Yeah, because I was going to look that up afterwards. Right. So, <laughs> openness, like, it's, like, it's like openness to experience, if right, you will. Right. right? And, so, um, and, and so what's really cool is someone said, Steve, I used to be a DJ. And I said, and he goes, can I play some music? I go, sure. That guy had his own boom box. He pulled it out. He put on his playlist and also music started playing. And then people started moving. And before you know it, there was a line dance going on. See, and the line dance going on and they were having the best time. So you're, why it's metaphorical, the notion yeah. of, of, of inclu yeah. you know, inclusion is the dance. 
it was yeah. really it brought to mind this the, this beautiful nature of these folks getting together and just having a great time through being together and they respected herb and they they didn't drag him out on the dance floor uh and herb was great he, but he was glad to be right there in the mix of it he, you know and so forth so herb why don't you close us out kim this has been wonderful this is a beginning not an end to us having time with you Aww, so thank you and, and i'm i'm really bad at um dropping um things uh in the chat but kimberly barker uh is, you know, uh, that's my YouTube and my LinkedIn. But Steve, I'm going to send you some links if you wouldn't mind sharing them with the group. Yep, yep, please and do. Uh, also, there's an article that I recently uh, did in Authority Magazine that tells a little bit more of stuff. So I'd love to share it. We'll, can, we'll share okay. all of your stuff with everybody. Yes. They'd love to have it. And okay. Herb, you want to give us a closing reflection as we wrap up for today? Well, first of all, thank you for your insights and your time. And, and, and I will tell you from my own experience, that whole uh, relationship and empathy tied to successful leadership has, has been my experience as well. So I, it was uh, affirming to hear you mention those things and, and the other insights that you brought to us. But, uh, but again, thank you for, for what you brought to us and thank everyone for, for attending today. So, yeah, yeah, thank pleasure. you. And, and, and here at Bowling Green State University, uh, we are committed to creating a better world that works for all and creating a and creating a world where we can transform and revitalize and develop the best in people. And uh, Kim, I consider you a big part of that. So I appreciate your commitment to that. So from a place where all things change, I appreciate you all and we'll see you soon. Bye for now. Bye guys.